following message is a presentation of Valley Metro Church, a community of believers dedicated to knowing God and making Him known. There's a light that the train conductor needs to see. If that light is green, he can go. If it's red, he must stop. You see, God has given us road signs in our life that we must read. Lines that tell us to go and lines that tell us to stop. Whether we read those and believe them or not is up to us. That's why some of you have fallen and you cannot get up. But tonight, that's why I'm here. The boat needed to come through, so he called, and the man said, okay, I got time. It's a long time before the train should come. So he pulls the lever, as you just saw, and the big, big, huge stone steel bridge, the gears started turning. They started cranking the steam. All of a sudden, gears are moving, and that big, huge bridge is just starting to go up. As it rises higher and higher, he has to watch and make sure everything's set, everything's good, everything's fine. As he looks out the window, he can see everything, but the dad, being a good dad, keeps one eye on his work but the other eye on his baby one eye on the world but the other eye on his children you think God doesn't know where you are he keeps one eye on his world and one eye on his child no matter what you've done or where you've been it's one eye on the world but the other eyes on you he's watched you and he's kept you even though your train is coming down the track he understands that and even though sometimes I don't know I want to get ahead of myself see the red light he didn't see it. So many times we don't see the red light. See, to just say, the train was early. The boy can hear and see the steam. And he looks and says, Daddy, the train. Daddy, Daddy, the train's early. Daddy, you got a daddy. Hey, Daddy, 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 the train. Daddy, the train's coming. But the dad was looking at the gears, making sure he had enough oil, making sure there was enough steam to get the bridge back down for the train. And the boy, the boy knew one thing. Now listen, the boy knew that his dad one time showed him where the trigger was. It was a red lever. If he pulls it, the train bridge would collapse down fast and the train would be able to come across. All the boy knew was there were people on that train. There were people that needed to be saved. There were people that had, some of them just with their friends having a good time. Like everything's fine. They did not know that the bridge was up. They did not know what was coming. They're just living their life like you and me. Just going down the road. Just being our own thing. Doing our own thing. And the dad all of a sudden hears the train coming. He looks and then he says, oh my son. He looks out and his boy's gone. He's like, oh my God, where's my son? Where's my son? He got to figure out. He looks back just in time to see his son trying to save the day. All he had to do was pull that lever. He reaches in to pull it, and the boy pulls too far, and he falls in the hole. Now it's on the father, and God the father. Did you hear me? God the father has to make a choice. It's his now. Do I save my son, or do I save the world? But they don't even know. They don't even know. The greatest decision of his life. He can blame it on them not seeing the red light. He can blame it doesn't matter anymore. Pull the lever, save the world. Leave it up, save your son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whosoever leaves in him No, the train goes by. It's fine. Everything's cool. The bridge is down. Just like always. It's always going to be down. Are you hearing me tonight? He gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave. And you know what's amazing? I wonder what God did right when his son died on that cross. When he breathed his last breath. When he took that breath and he breathed and it was over. Here's what the father would have looked like. They didn't even know just trying to think of their life. 
just trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Just thinking about the person they're going to see, the people they're going to hang out with. Just trying to be, just loving, caring. Doesn't matter if you're blind. Doesn't matter if you're putting on a little more makeup, trying to look pretty for somebody, or just wearing another mask. It doesn't matter. God gave his son for you. What will I do when I grow up? Where will I go when I grow up? What will I have change? And there was a girl in the bathroom on the train, liquefying her heroin to shoot up one more time. He died for her. He died for her. But in one moment, are you listening? In one moment, as the Bible says, everybody gets a chance. In one moment, to see the look of the Father when He knows what He, when you realize what He did for you, when you realize the sacrifice, when you realize He let His Son die so that you can live, when you realize what He did, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at in this life, no matter what you're a part of, you gotta stop. You gotta stop. Even if it's for one second and think, my God, he did it for me. He did it for me. And I pray to God you drop what you're doing. Drop what you're doing. With all the pain and the hurt and the sorrow in the world, he did it for you. That's why you're so quiet. You see, the train's coming. The train's coming. Everybody has things. You have ways of, of I don't want to do that. I don't want to, but why do I keep doing it? Even Paul said, why do I do? My flesh tells me, and I do what I know is wrong, and I don't do what I know is right. you got to understand tonight, the fight is on, and we can win. We become more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And I'm not preaching just for me. I'm preaching on behalf of you. But what you got to understand is... It's powerful. Um, you know, he did it for you, for each and every one of you, and he did it for me. And I think that video very clearly expresses, I think the longer that we are in church and the longer that we are used to hearing that, we can kind of become numb. And we become, it, it's just a thing. It's, it's the story. It's the gospel. But does it impact every moment that we have? Does it impact every day that we have? Does it impact every decision that we make? Because that's what God is calling us into. He's calling us into take my message, take what I did for you into the world because I've set you free. You know, this morning, I am not Pastor Brian. I am his wife, but this morning, I'm I'm gonna, we're going to have what I call as a family meeting. And you may, this may be your first time here, and you may think, oh, no, I came on the wrong day. And actually, you didn't because God called you here to this day. So we want to welcome you. So we actually have a gift outside for you but, and um, a message inside for you. And God has something to say to each and every one of us. Um, but at our house on Sunday nights, we usually have family night. And that's a night where the person that it's their family night, they get to pick the dinner of the evening and um, whatever we're going to do. Um, but, and then sometimes we have family meetings. Now, my kids would tell you this is when they're in trouble, but that's not it. It's when we sense, um, Pastor Brian and I, when we sense that our family needs either a shift change is coming in our family or we need to make some kind of shift. And I have been sensing that for our church. And so let's have a family meeting today, okay? Let's have a, have a talk to see what's working and what's not. Um, and uh, as ba- Pastor Brian talked about last week, our, the word that he, God has given us for the year is grow. And, you know, we've been talking a lot in our women's Bible study about goals, and we're all past resolutions, and we're past Valentine's Day. And so now we get to look at what are we going to do for the rest of the year now that our resolutions have failed. Are we going to write down our goals? Are they going to be smart goals? Are they going to be biblical? Are they going to be measurable and meaningful? And are they going to be written? Are we going to do 2019 different than 2018? And how does that get done? That 
gets done by getting with the Lord and writing things down. But also, are we going to love well beyond Valentine's Day, right? Valentine's Day is one day where people go all out to show their love, and then you think about, well, what about the rest of the year? So I think we're all in a really good place because we're, like I said, beyond the resolutions, beyond Valentine's Day, and now we're going to see what God is saying for the rest of the year. And again, if you didn't hear last week's message on Grow, it was absolutely amazing. I encourage us all to go back because God is calling, that is the word for the church for this year. It's to grow. It's to grow personally. It's to grow in influence and leadership, and it's to grow the church. And so um, we're excited about that because we, we do sense a change, you know, and I'll even tell you, I was driving last night with my little girl who doesn't sit in the services and she doesn't listen to our sermons and she um, is usually out of all church leadership meetings, not all, but most. Um, but she said last night, Mom, I sense God is about to grow this church and he's calling for change. And I was... I needed to hear that at that moment and just to be reminded. But from this little mouth, he said, he just keeps telling me over and over he's about to do something big. And so um, that for us is such encouragement because that's what we have felt that God is saying and what he's doing. But I want to look at why. Why grow? Is this about church growth so that we can fill all the seats and feel good about ourselves? Absolutely not. It's, it's about reaching the world, reaching the lost. You know, we are God's chosen vehicle to reach the lost. He doesn't have a plan B. And, you know, we have to look, dig deep inside in order to be able to see what's not working so that we can see what is working. And I know I've told my testimony um, several times before of how I grew up in the Bible Belt in the South, and I saw a lot of religion but not a lot of real transformation. And um, just this year, um, since January, there were four very prominent figures in the uh, Christian leaders that have announced their separation from their spouses. Um, Last year, there was a pastor um, of a mega church. He has three three small children and a wife. He decided to take his own life. Um, Monthly, if not weekly, we hear of pastors caught in adultery, pornographic addiction, drug addiction with prostitutes are equally destructive and out-of-control situations. Um, There's a head of a world-changing ministry, and I want to say this is probably the ministry that has made the most impact on world hunger, hunger, the, the Christian ministry. And he literally fed the whole world while he starved his own wife and children of his love, of his leadership, and of his presence. You know, there was a major uh, mega, past, mega church pastor that lived a double life for over 10 years and all came out in the news and it was ugly and awful. But he, of uh, drugs and prostitutes and just, just all kinds of roads of destruction. And over the years, Pastor Brian and I, we've sat down and counseled with people who, who tried to manage and justify their sin rather than getting rid of it. And we know that of the, all the whole mess in the Catholic Church with priest and, and abuse and pedophilia and all that goes on. And, and the reason that I bring all this up is not to drudge up, but to address what I feel like the church needs to address more often is that we cannot live in one world and hide our sin and expect freedom in the next. We can't hide our sin and be free of our sin. You know, Second Corinthians Um, tells us that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And over the years, since I've been a Christian, I've wondered why myself, why I don't see myself renewed, and why I don't see a large portion of the body of Christ renewed. Like, what's going on? But Jesus calls us a new creation, and yet I see people struggling outside of the church and inside of the church. I see people justifying their sin, justifying their hate, justifying their anger, justifying their prejudice. Why do they do that and call themselves Christians? You know, we can't lead people where we're not. And God is, he, there is an invitation to be real. We're in a hospital. I know Isaac said it earlier. We're in a ho- this is a hospital where you get free. This is a place 
Jesus designed his bride to be a place where we can come in and be real and say, I'm struggling and I'm hurting and I don't know the answers and we can find freedom. The other option is to come in with a mask and pretend like everything is good and fine and how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine too. And, and to just keep on living and, and hiding our sin and hiding what's hindering us rather than getting free. Because when we get free we are able to change the world. But when we hide our sin, we live in shame and condemnation, and we just survive rather than thrive. Romans 12, 1 and 2, in the Passion Translation says, Beloved friends, what should we be, be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be his living sacrifices. You know, a living sacrifice is a willing sacrifice. A, willing, uh, a living sacrifice is completely offers themselves up. So we're called to be living sacrifices and to live in holiness, experiencing all that the, delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. When we live in holiness, that is our genuine expression of worship. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will and live the beautiful life and satisfying and perfect in his eyes. And you know, the, you think about what, is the ide- what are the current ideals and opinions of the culture? It's to live how we feel like living, right? Just to live out of our feelings. If it feels good, do it. And, it, and to justify our actions. And in the church, it's not that much different. You know, there is, there, I, I see it often that we, we stumble over what we feel like we want to do or what we want to justify rather than saying, this is wrong and I'm going to throw it off. And I'm going to do what God is calling me to do rather than what I feel like doing. And that's why we have these pastors all along and these Christian leaders and the priest and, the, and people in the church that are not living lives that are thriving and as new creations because they still have that hidden sin. They still have that part of them that they haven't dealt with. And really what we're talking about is soul health. It's also called emotional intelligence. It's called emotional health. And you think, oh my goodness, we're gone from the Bible to psychology. Actually not. We're actually talking about a very important part of us that we we often learn about hermeneutics and the origin of the Bible and apologetics. And we learn about what, what exactly, what translations are why and the history of the church. But very seldom do we talk about emotional maturity, what it really takes to be a spiritually mature Christian, because we cannot be a spiritually mature Christian. We can know all the books of the Bible, and we can know, memorize every verse, but if we are not emotionally mature Christians and don't handle things biblically, then we're not really spiritually mature. You know, God is calling us to live a life of integrity. Everything that Jesus did, he already paid for. It's finished, it's done, it's over, but it's ours for the taking. And the invitation of Jesus is to bring all that we have, everything that's broken, everything that's, that is wounded, everything that you can't figure out and a solution to, and to bring it to the foot of the cross where he already has a solution. But oftentimes we hide our sin and we try to manage our sin and we say, well, this is just how I am or this is how my parents were or this is, this is just how my personality. And we excuse things rather than addressing things. And, you know, it's been said that emotions are like children. You can't put them in the trunk and you can't let them drive. So true, right? Um, when you put them in the trunk... When you put your emotions and you just separate from them and say, those, I, I can't have those in my life, what happens is we suppress things, and that's where addictions come from. That's where um, all kinds of damage comes from internally when we begin to just separate and fragment ourselves and put them aside. But if we let them drive, what happens? We crash. We hurt people, right? Because how many of you struggle with one day you feel a certain way, and then two weeks later you're like, oh, what was that ever about, right? Our emotions 
are good passengers, but never good drivers. And we need to remember that because oftentimes this culture is, sends a, a message, a constant message that we need to do what's right. We need to do what we feel, not necessarily what's right. And we, they often validate their emotions by saying, this is right because this is what I feel. So how do we grow in emotional health? You know, we're not going to go through the whole thing today, but because it is extensive and because it's hard work and because it takes time and because we don't have that time this morning, but how do we address it very simply by going back and looking at the patterns of our past, the patterns of the people that we love? Is this to blame them? Absolutely not. But it is to say, they, my, my family handled conflict. My, ha- my family handled anger. My ha- family handled sexual immorality. My family handled it this way, and yet the Bible says to handle it this way. Therefore, I need to put off what, my, what the, the norm was in my family, what, I, what was the learned behavior, and I need to put on what the Bible says because what the Bible says is going to set me free. What my family says is going to pass on generational curses to the rest. And, you know, if we're not willing to address the inconsistencies in our life and, and compare them to the Bible, we do one of three things. We, we either blame other people and we live in denial of our own dysfunction and we just pass it off. But really, we don't pass it off, we pass it on. We pass it on to our children, we pass it on to... Our, our spiritual children, and we pass it on to the next generation. Whatever we're not willing to deal with, they have to deal with, and they have to figure out, oh, that wasn't right. I need to do something different. And so really, we're, 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 taking, we're, we're taking away from their growth. And so we either blame others. We cannot change what we do not confront. All of us has something. There is not a one of us in this room that has arrived. And if you think you've arrived, I will tell you right now that you struggle with judgment for the rest of us that haven't arrived. And so there is not one of us. We are moving from glory to glory. We are, we are being sanctified day by day. There are things that I used to do in my old life that God convicted me of that I don't even struggle with now. But there are things that I struggle with now that I have to work on now because I don't want to give those to my children either. I don't want to give pass those on through the body of Christ as acceptable or, or make excuses for it because people imitate what they see. We may be the only Jesus in people's lives and they may say, oh, it's okay to do that or it's okay to do that or, or that. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. He has chosen us to take the good news to the world. We owe it to the world, and to our families and friends to deal with our stuff, the things that we are struggling with, so that we can walk as new creations and that the world will see something different rather than a bunch of hypocrites. So either we, we blame each other and live denial and in denial, or else we live a double life. We come to church, we're all fine, and then we go home and we act like hellions. We cover up the areas that we don't want to address. We don't want to bring these things into the light. But Jesus says, bring everything into the light so that, he, that we can find his mercy and his grace. The bravest and the most godly approach is to deal with it, is to call it out, admit that we struggle, take full responsibility for it, and do the hard work of the Holy Spirit and wise counsel to overcome it. That is the imitation. That is what love does. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. We're not, no, there's not a, one of us in this room that is perfect, and there's not a one of us in this room that Jesus wants us to feel sit and feel shame and condemnation today. But he wants us to taste and see that there is liberation in coming clean. There is liberation in confessing your sins so that he can forgive us and that we can be free. What we hide, we keep back, we, we hold on to, we try to manage, and we cannot manage sin. There is no addiction, there is, there is no, no sin that is manageable. There is no ungodly habit that is, that is manageable. Whatever we tolerate in life will increase. You know, we, we have a sin problem, but really where there's a sin problem, there's a love problem. Because if you knew how loved you were, if you knew how completely and totally loved and accepted you were, 
you would be so bold as to deal with every single problem in your life. We would confront things from a place of love and not from a place of shame and condemnation. We would, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, for the love of Christ controls us. Another version says it compels us, it consumes us, it constrains us. Does, do you know the love of Christ? Do you know how loved you are? And that's why we began with this video, is because if you know how loved you are, you will be brave and courageous enough to say, this is a place I, will, I struggle with, but I don't want to struggle anymore. I want to be free. I want the freedom that is promised, that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, that the old has gone, and I want it gone. How many of you want it gone? Amen. We, we're called to live freely, and anything else we we are, any place that we are not living free, we are letting the devil win in our life and it cheapens the blood of Christ that's already been poured out and paid for everything that we have. It's finished. It has been finished, but it is ours for the taking. And you know, I, along with you, wish that we could be zapped the moment we walk down or raise our hand to accept the Lord and that we would instantly become a new creation. But that is not reality, I have sadly found out. That it is about walking it out. It is about throwing off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us so that we can run the race that's set before us. This, the call of this church is to be part of an unprecedented revival. We can't make revival happen, but we can usher it in. And to to usher in the Holy Spirit like never before, to see signs and wonders, to see people healed, body, soul, and spirit, to be to live this would be the most exhilarating, life-changing event that we have ever seen. But God is calling us to address the hidden spaces in our life, the hidden places, the hidden sin, the things that we don't want to be bring to light. In this room, we we have issues of pornography. We have issues of drug addiction, alcohol addiction. We have issues of self-loathing, self-hating. We have issues of selfishness. We have issues of anger. We have issues of of pornography addiction. We have, there are all kinds of things right within this room. And every week we have people here that are willing to not judge you, but to stand with you and pray with you. But why don't we want to get free? There's a lie in every one of us that believes that whatever sin we're coddling or hiding, that it's safer inside of us than being left at the cross and walking in freedom. And God is calling us today, church, family, to, God is calling us to address those things the worry and the fear that, that, that pains us, that we worry about the future. You know, every time you, anybody has any worry about the future, they are not picturing their future with the Lord. They're not picturing their future with Jesus in it. It's always when we worry and we fear, we can't walk in the present because we're living in the future right? And we're living in a future without Jesus. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised us that he came to set the captive free, that he has done everything that we need. He's given us everything for life and godliness, but it's up to us to take it. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us. Everything means everything. And that the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run the race that, with endurance that's set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. We are being cheered on, and I know I talk about this all the time, by Abraham, by Sarah, by the man who was sawed in half, by people who were beheaded and persecuted for their faith. They are sitting, waiting for us to finish our leg of the race. They're cheering us on. They're saying, trust me, get rid of that. You don't need that. That's hindering your race. You're not reaching the world because you're living in shame and condemnation. 
God is calling us to throw off everything. We cannot grow an emotionally healthy church if we are, ourselves are not addressing the hidden issues in our lives. Okay, here it is, the test. Tell your neighbor, I have issues. And now tell them, I love you enough to address them. Church, it is time for us to get real. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's time that we love God enough and that we take in his love. And like I said, wherever we have some kind of blockage in our life, it's, we have a love problem. We don't understand the love that is unconditionally poured out on our life. God is not asking us for perfection. Jesus Jesus is our perfection. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus and his perfection. But God is calling us to be real with one another and to be the church that says, it's okay if you have issues because I have issues too. Guess what? Pastor Brian and I have issues. We do. We're just as human as the rest of you. We, we, I know some people think that we live on the hallelujah train, but we don't. We get off. We get off. We raise our voices. We disagree. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you see our part in there? Our part is to confess our sins and pray for each other. And what is his promise? That we will be healed. Our sins could be learned behavior. It can be generational curses. It can be subconscious. It can be unintentional. It doesn't matter. But what we have to do is be real and look at them and say, this is where I'm struggling. Love deals with its sins. Love owns its own weaknesses. Love works hard to work through them. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And so here's the reason that we have to and that we're called to, and that we actually get to be free of our junk. Because if we don't want to, we are cursing the next generation. We are cursing our own children. We are cursing our spiritual children because we're saying, I am too lazy to work this out. You are going to have to figure it out. And I know, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not going to be harsh. I'm just getting my mom tone. Um, There were... um, these, these group of elephants, um, this herd of elephants, they weren't a group, um, but they were the, a herd of elephants in Africa. I heard this story a while back, and it's just resonated with me so much of where we're at in our culture and our society. So where there, there was this herd of elephants in this one park in, in South Africa, and the, it, the population of the elephants just got out of control. And so they were trying to figure out what to do because they were really like just kind of taking over and and really putting the ecosystem out of whack. And so they decided that they were going to do, um, moving elephants is not an easy task. So they decided they would use these helicopters and um, like hoist these elephants up through the, like do these belts underneath them and hoist them up and move them to another park that didn't have very many elephants. And so as they did begin to do that, the belts were breaking, and they were having a really hard time. And so this isn't a joke, by the way. This is a real thing. Um, so they, were, they realized that they couldn't take but a certain weight. And so that excluded the mature males in, in the group, of, in the herd of elephants. And so they ended up just moving over the young male elephants, but not the older ones, and then some female elephants. And so... A couple of weeks into this, they began to realize that all the rhinoceroses were ending up dead. And they thought, did we bring some kind of virus over? And so they set up cameras. They thought it was poachers, but then they were, the tusks um, were still on the rhinoceroses. And so they were trying to just figure out what exactly is the problem. So they set up these cameras, and they realized that it was the young male elephants that were killing the rhinoceroses. So they looked at it, and they were like, what is different from this, which we've never seen this before, this aggression in these young males? What is different over in this part? The only missing element was the mature, older male elephants. 
So they reconfigured their belts and decided they were going to move some of the mature male elephants over to the other park. Within two weeks, all the killing stopped because they had the mature male elephants show them how to live. We are in a fatherless society. I guarantee if we took a poll in this room, we would have over half of us that have grown up without fathers. But we are also living in a spiritually fatherless society because at large, we are missing spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers who are willing to do the hard work to show the younger generation how to live, to stand up. And, and you know, we may, they, they may be there, but they're very quiet. And it's time, you know, I think about the gangs and, and how, how fatherlessness has affected all of society. I mean, there are statistics that's, that 63% of all suicides are from fatherless, a fatherless um, home. Uh, about 75 to 95% of all inmates grew up in a fatherless home. You know, um, all the ADD and ADHD is oftentimes, 85% of that, of behavior disorders, comes from homes where there's not a father. All 80% of all rapes are from, from boys who didn't have fathers. 71% of all high school dropouts are from boys, are, are, are people that don't have fathers. There is such a need for great male leadership and female leadership in our society. Because you think about it, you think about these, these elephants, these young male elephants, without the absence of them moving those elephants on, what would have happened? They would start, this would be the way of life, right? And elephants would completely change their nature and make laws, elephant laws, elephant rules, they do that, um, to, to go along with their beliefs. Does that sound familiar? That's what we're seeing in our culture today and in society today. Without us rising up and, and standing up for what is right and dealing with our stuff so we don't pass it on to the next generation, we are letting this next generation try to figure it out from the brokenness that has never been dealt with. And Jesus dealt with it all on the cross, so it's ours for the taking. And the invitation is to come in and deal with our stuff and to be whole and new and fresh and renewed and transformed by his word. But we have to do the hard work. It's time. It's time for us to grow personally. We get one shot at life. Everybody in this room has the rest of their life. No one is, is too late. But Jesus is calling each and every one of us to come into a place where we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are saved, sanctified, set free, and that we can go out and let love compel us, consume us, and to to go out into a lost and dying world and lead them by the hand and say, this is the way. God is calling us to grow in influence. He's calling us to grow the church. Will you let the love of Christ control you? Will you let the love of Christ constrain you? Will you let the love of Christ compel you? Do you see all these empty seats around us? are not to be filled by other people from other churches. They're to be filled by, with our lost brothers and sisters, people who have lost their way, people who have never known the right way, and God has called each and every one of us to fill the seats around us. That is our job. It's not to survive, it's to thrive. It's to live the abundant life here and now. But it takes hard work. This isn't just for you. This isn't just for our family. This isn't just for our churches. This is for the world. 
Second Chronicles 7.14 gives us the answer of what do we do. And it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. He promises that he is going to heal our hindering habits, our hindering sins. He's going to heal your heart. He's going to heal your relationship. He's going to heal your marriage. He's going to heal your home. He's going to heal your kids. He's going to heal your neighborhood. He's going to heal your city. He's going to heal your state. He's going to heal the nation. He's going to heal the world. But he chose us. We are the messengers. There is no plan B. You know, there was, Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military generals that ever lived. And he conquered almost the entire known world with his army. And after one fierce battle, they would bring in um, the people that were, had committed war, war crimes. And they brought in a young boy who was younger than 14, who had fought in the battle. And, he, and Alexander the Great said, what is his crime? And, he said, and the soldiers said, cowardly actions. And so Alexander the Great looked at him and he said, young man, what is your name? And the boy, trembling, said, my name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great once more said, I said, what is your name? And again, a little louder, he said, Alexander. And Alexander the Great one more time said, I said, son, what is your name? And the little boy, just a, a little bit louder, said, Alexander. And Alexander the Great looked at him and he said, young man, Change your name or change your ways. Church, God is calling us. He's calling us to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And it's, it's not throwing it off once. It's dealing with whatever it may be, but to become real so that the world will be able to come in and find real people who have been fully redeemed, who find people who walk as new creations, who can identify, yes, I've struggled with that, but take heart. Jesus has paid for this, and he's overcome the world. There is an invitation today that we need to stand up and stand up and say, uh, no more will I hide. No more will I blame other people for my sin. No more. I will fight for the freedom that Jesus has already paid for. If you are in agreement with me, if God has been tugging on your heart, if you are ready to let go of everything that hinders you, will you stand with me? Will you stand and say, I don't want to hide. I want to stand. I want to be the new creation that Christ Jesus paid for. I am done with low living. I am done with pretending. I have been set free. Lord God, I pray with every single person in this room. I thank you, Lord, that we are ready to get real. Lord, we are ready for your love to compel us to fight for the freedom that you've already paid for. I pray, Lord God, that we would also fight for the lost souls that are right outside at the park, at the store, at our in our jobs, every Everywhere in our neighborhoods, Lord God, we want to fight for them. We want a war for them. We want a war for this next generation. I pray that we would be the spiritual mothers and fathers that you've called us to be. That no more, Lord God, would we be okay with status quo, but that we would walk as new creations because we love you and we obey your commands because we love you. All we need is your love. Infiltrate us with your love. Blast every lie in us and help us to walk in victory and freedom every single moment of the day. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. 
This has been a presentation of Valley Metro Church. To hear more messages or to support future podcasts, please visit us at valleymetrochurch.com.